All right, we are recording. Um, like I already told you two that are here online live right now, I want to say it again for the recording for anybody watching the video. Please excuse any noises you hear and things like that because it is a Saturday and my family is just doing regular family things. So I'm going to turn my camera off right now. And unfortunately, there's nothing I can do about the background noise once it starts. But here we go. Camera's off. Anyway, before we talk about the actual study guides, which is what the exam is based on, I want to mention the same thing I mentioned last time. Um, the exam is online. It'll open up. Should be 8 o'clock at the latest. Um, I don't like last time. The, I didn't think it opened up early enough, so I'm gonna, and it was automated. So I'm trying to get it to open up a little bit earlier. But again, just like last time, you can start it whenever you want. As soon as you see it, either in Google Classroom or in your email, whichever one you're looking at to see it, um, you can start it. The thing is, you absolutely positively have to finish by 8.50 a.m. Every minute that you're late, you're going to lose 10 points. So don't submit it late. And if something comes up, like if the dog pees on your computer or Russia attacks your neighborhood, then just stop the exam and contact me right away and say, hey, something came up. I know I won't be able to finish this by 8.50. And then we'll figure out some other arrangements where you can start over and at some other time. So that's how that goes. Um, and again, just like last time, you cannot miss the exam. If you miss the exam without telling me, then you're going to have a harder, the longer you wait to take it, the harder it'll be. Um, what else to say? Let's see, no class after the exam. We're just done when we're done. We will have lab on Monday. Uh, what else for the exam? I guess that's it. Does anybody have, do you guys have questions about the exam? Not like the actual material because we're going to cover that here in a second but just the application and how the the administration of the exam any questions all right good pretty straightforward all right there will be an extra credit component but i'll get to that a little bit later in this video so here we go let's jump into the actual material um and let's start with the chapter five study guide now i don't know how much time you guys have so what I'll do first is see if you have any specific questions from the chapter five study guide and then see if you have any specific questions from the chapter six and seven study guide. And then once I've done answering your specific questions, then if I have time, I'll come back and go through all the questions, like all the ones that weren't covered. So that being said, do either one of you have any specific questions about the chapter five study guide? I do not have any specific questions. Okay. Vance, do you? All right. How about, okay. Uh, if you, uh, like I said, if you don't, then I'll just go through them one by one. How about chapter the six and seven? Is there anything specific or do you just want me to go through it one by one? No, you can just go through it. Yeah, you can do it one by one because you gave me like 14 incorrect. So. Perfect. Okay. Well, then, yeah, then we will start with chapter five. Where are we at here? Chapter five. OK, this is out of order, but that's OK, because I don't want somebody to watch this video and use this video as a way to just answer the study guide. And I want to make it at least a little bit challenging. But here we go. Number 33, if placed in tap water, an animal cell will undergo lysis, whereas a plant cell will not. What accounts for this difference? So basically, this is saying, you know, if you put cells in water, um an animal cell is going to blow up and a plant cell will not blow up so either way we know that water is coming into the cell whether it's an animal cell or a plant cell the question is then why isn't the plant cell actually exploding unlike the animal cell and the answer is because it has a cell wall so um d the answer is d for number 33 any questions about that now i'm not sure if that question will be on the exam in that much detail but at the very least, you should know that plant cells do better with water coming in um, and animal cells do not. Because, again, just like it says right here, an animal cell will explode if it has water coming in. But um, a plant cell actually thrives in that situation. All right. A balloon, can, a balloon contains a 10 percent glucose solution. The balloon is permeable to water, but not glucose. The beaker contains 5% glucose solution. These are a lot of extra words just to slow you down and confuse you. Here's the thing. Um, the balloon has 10%. The beaker has 5%. So it's a higher concentration inside the balloon than it is outside of the balloon. Um, so then we know that the water is going to go into the balloon. 
because the balloon, the more water we put into that balloon, the lower that concentration is going to get, right? Because you'll have more water and less glucose. Meanwhile, the more water that's leaving the beaker, the higher that concentration is going to get. Remember, and we want that's going to happen until those numbers equal out each other, which is what we call equilibrium. So the choices are, let's see, the volume of the water in the beaker will increase. And no, that's the opposite because the water is going to leave the beaker and go into the balloon. The amount of glucose in the beaker will decrease. That's way off. You would actually lose more points for that because the question even says the balloon is permeable, permeable to water, but not glucose. So glucose isn't going anywhere. Um, same thing with C here. The amount of glucose in the beaker will increase. Nope. Glucose isn't going anywhere. You'll probably lose more points for guessing that. Um, and here's the correct answer. The volume of water in the beaker will decrease because, again, the water is trying to go into the area of higher concentration, which is the balloon. Do you guys have any questions about that? Does that make sense? All right. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Did you? Oh, no, I was saying, oh, okay. I was saying it makes sense. Okay, good. So for the exam, if there's a question like this on the exam, Keep in mind that I would change the wording, right? So it might not be glucose. It might be something else, but it doesn't matter what it is. That part's trivial. But the part that would be important is the numbers. So maybe I'll say the balloon contains 5% and the beaker contains 10%, in which case um, B would be the correct answer. The volume of water in the beaker would increase. So keep that in mind um, for that question. I might change the numbers. I might flip-flop them or they might come up with completely new numbers. So anyway, I'm not sure I'll have this question on there because it's so easy, but a boulder at the top of a hill contains what kind of energy? And the answer is potential. Um, because when we talked about energy, there's two basic types. There's kinetic and there's potential. Kinetic is when something's moving. Potential is when um, it's not moving, but it has energy based on its location or its structure. Excuse me, I'm leaving where I'm going to be leaving the room so you guys can hear me a little bit better. There we go. Anyway, so yes, the answer is potential. Um, now, be careful. If you see a question like that on the exam, I might change the wording. I might say a boulder rolling down a hill contains blank energy, in which case the answer would be kinetic. Another thing to note is if you were to see this question, um, again, potential is the correct answer. If you got guessed kinetic, you might get half credit. But if you guess anything else, then you would get zero credit because the only two types of energy we talked about were either kinetic or potential so any questions about number five all right number 15 usually enzymes are what the answer is simply proteins there's not much to say about that they are simply proteins now your book does point out or the the word excuse me this does use the word usually because there are some exceptions that we didn't talk about you can look that up if you want but as far as we're concerned in this course, enzymes are always proteins. Any questions? Okay. 38, specialized cells that line the stomach, synthetic, blah, 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 blah. I'm not even going to read that. That's not going to be on the exam. But the point here is, though, we're talking about a digestive enzyme, meaning it's being secreted, meaning it's leaving the cell, meaning the answer is exocytosis. But again, that won't be on the exam. How are membrane transports like enzymes? This one might be on the exam. Um, neither can change the result of gene mutations. We haven't even talked about mutations yet, so you can cross that one off. Both are made from RNA molecules. We haven't really talked about RNA other than in chapter three when we talked about what nucleic acids are, so that you can cross that one off. Both require energy to function properly. That's not true, but at least that one makes more sense in the context of what you've learned so far this semester. And here we go. Here's the correct answer. Both are specialized to the material they act upon. So transport proteins, sometimes they do require energy, right? Sometimes they do require ATP, like the ones in the electron transport chain that pump hydrogen ions against their concentration gradient. But they don't always. Try to remember back when, when you see this question on the exam, try to think back on the, the lecture where I talked about how if you had 500 people in the auditorium and nobody in the hallway, Naturally, people are going to want to diffuse out of the auditorium and into the hallway, but they can't, right? Because the doors are closed. But if you were to open the doors, then people would just naturally diffuse out, right? There would be no required energy to get them out the door. They would just do it. So, yeah. Any questions about number 44? 
All right. I'm sorry about all the noise, everybody. I'm, I was inside where my kids were being loud, and now I'm outside where people are doing it's not good. Work, work with tools. Uh, okay. What compound provides energy? Excuse me. Directly provides energy for cellular work. And like I said, this is the one. If you don't remember anything else from Chapter 5, this is what you should remember. The answer is ATP. ATP directly provides energy. Now, you could say, where does the energy for cells ultimately come from? And I don't think I'm going to use that question, but just it's just a good time to remind you that ultimately that energy came from the sun, right? Um, so, yes, the answer is ATP. Sugar is like the trick question because if you think back to respiration, what you know about it, respiration is we break down glucose to make the ATP, but it is the ATP itself that directly provides energy for cellular work. Um, any questions about that? Oh, this is a good time to remind you too, if that were to be on the exam, this might be one of those situations where at least if you guessed um, sugar, you might get half credit. Um, obviously, ATP is the correct answer and anything else other than that would be zero credit. Anyway, number 23, which statement about enzymes is true? Let's see. An enzyme's function depends on its three-dimensional shape. Yeah, that is true. So for right now, for this question, that is the correct answer. But let's talk really quickly about how I could change some of the options to make them correct on the exam. An enzyme works on a broad range of substrates. That is incorrect. But if I were to change this to say an enzyme works on specific substrates, then that would be correct. An enzyme is used up in a chemical reaction. Incorrect. But if I were to change it to say an enzyme is not used up in a chemical reaction, then that would be the correct answer. An enzyme becomes another enzyme after a reaction. That's just goofiness. I don't even know how I would reword that. So whatever. Any questions about number 23? Uh, 39 definitely won't be on there um, on the exam. But when we're talking about engulfing something, in, in a sense, that's a sort of like a cellular eating, which means it would be phagocytosis, but not important for the semester or the exam. So let's move on. An object at rest has no blank energy, but it may have blank energy. We've already talked about this. If it's not moving, it has potential energy. If it is moving, it has kinetic energy. Don't memorize that question as you're reading it, because for the exam, if it's on there, I might change it to say um, an object at rest has blank energy, right? I might get rid of the word no. So an object at rest has potential energy. Oh, excuse me. I can I tricked myself. I'm glad I said that. An object at rest has no kinetic energy. There we go. But it may have potential energy resulting from its location or structure. So actually, the correct answer is A, and I caught myself on that. So you can see how easy it would be for you to mess up on the exam if I get rid of this word no here and put it here. And Because in that case, if we said an object at rest has potential energy, but it has no kinetic energy so on and so forth. So any questions about that one? And look, I know I'm going quick, but I'm only doing it for you guys because it's a Saturday. So if you want me to slow down, just tell me. I'm only going quick for your sake, not for mine. I'm not in a rush. Number 20, the combination of sucrose, sucrase, and water produces sucrase, glucose, and fructose. Um, this goes back to what I said during the lecture. <coughs> I said you're going to see... Okay. Sorry, what was that? Yeah, sucrase. So, oh, um, component is enzyme. Yes, it is sucrase. Um, for the exam, you won't see this exact question because, like I said in the in the uh, lecture, I will make up. I will give you some reaction that you've never seen before. So it'll be some other words other than sucrose, sucrase, water, blah blah blah. I might even make up some words. But here's the key. Here's how you know it's the enzyme because, as far as we're concerned in this class enzymes end with the word ace so are there any questions so yes like you said it's sucrase because that's the thing that ends with ace so that is the enzyme on a follow-up to that and if this was not being shuffled you would see this is the next question i could give you the same question and then say which component of the reaction is the substrate uh in vance do you want to take that one it seems like you you knew sucrase so do you know the substrate in this situation and if you don't that's okay Sucrose. Perfect. Yes, yeah, sucrose. Because again, enzymes are basically, as far as we're concerned, they're named after their their substrate. So we know sucrase 
is the enzyme because it ends with ace. So obviously the, the thing that has a similar name is sucrose. So are there any questions about number 20? And again, it won't be sucrose and sucrase in the exam. It'll be something completely different that you've either never seen before or just some words that I made up. All right, 42, which of these molecules spontaneously forms membranes? Let's skip that. Don't even have time. That's not important for the exam or the semester. Enzymes increase the rate of reaction. This is very important. How do enzymes increase the rate of reaction? The answer is right there at the top. They decrease activation energy. And remember, activation energy is that energy required, that investment energy, if you will, that you have to put into a reaction to get it started. And the analogy I used in the lecture was like pushing a boulder down a hill. Like a boulder is going to roll down a hill. But imagine if you had like a little tiny hill that you had to get over first, like a little three foot hill. First, you got to put that energy, a little bit of energy to get it over that hill. But man, once you get it over that hill and it starts rolling down the big hill, that's going to put out a lot of energy, right? So that's decreasing activation energy. Um, yeah, there's nothing much to say about that. Any questions about that one? All right. Uh, when two solutions of different solute concentration are placed on either side of a selectively permeable membrane and osmosis is allowed to take place, the water will. So this question is a lot like the one we've already answered, except this one's specifically asking you what would happen in any situation like this, while the other question we've already talked about was more of a specific example that fell under this category. But anyway, let's look at the options. Exhibit a net movement to the side with a lower solute concentration. That's incorrect. The water is going to go towards the side with the higher concentration, right? The higher solute concentration because it wants to even things out. Sort of like if you had, um, I don't know, a gla two glasses of sweet tea and one of them was really, really sweet and the other one was not sweet enough. You would kind of like pour them back and forth a little bit back, you know, you would pour the the one that's not sweet enough into the one that was too sweet until you got to the perfect mix, right? And really what you're doing there is putting more water into that sweet tea mix because you're trying to dilute it. So anyway, that's why that's not the right answer. Exhibit a net movement to the side with lower water concentration. That is actually true. Um, yes. So the answer is A, exhibit a net movement to the side with a lower water concentration. So keep this in mind. Um I could reword these options to where C says, exhibit a net movement to the side with the higher solute concentration, in which case that would be correct. And of course I would have to make this one incorrect, in which case I would say, well, this one, exhibit a net movement to the side with a higher water concentration. So there you go, yes. The answer is A, but the, the, the correct answer in this version talks about the water concentration, but I could change it to deal with the solute concentration. Um, and then obviously this one's not correct because it's not gonna just go in both directions. It's gonna go, it is, it's gonna equal things out. So any questions about number 30? Okay, and by the way, this whole thing that, that's being described here with the water going from one place to the other until things equal out, that's called dynamic equilibrium. Good time to remind you of that. All right, we've already kind of answered this one, but here it is again. An enzyme's function is most dependent on what? It's shape. It's three-dimensional shape. It's all about the shape. Of course, activation energy has something to do with it. Size might sometimes. Temperature definitely affects the shape. But ultimately, shape is the most correct answer on here. So any questions about that? All right. A cell that neither gains nor loses in a, a net amount of water at equilibrium when immersed in a solution is what? So again, Water's not leaving the cell. Water's not coming in. That means it is isotonic to its environment. That means whatever, like, let's just say we're talking about, I don't know, sucrose solution. That means, for example, it's 5% sucrose solution inside the cell and 5% solution outside the cell. So there's no reason for water to move to one side or the other. There's no need for the water to try to dilute one side. So that is why that is the answer. Any questions about 31? Speaking of which, on this, if you were to see a question like this on the exam, this would be one of those good ones for you guys because there's a three-fourth chance you would do pretty good because if you were to guess C or D or B, you know, these two, then you'd at least get half credit because that is part of the discussion we've had. Hypotonic, hypertonic, 
but metabolically inactive, that's just some garbage thrown in there. So if you guess the garbage, you're going to lose more points. That being said, now are there any questions about number 31? All right. Speaking about metabolism, the sum total of all the chemical reactions that occur in an organism is called metabolism. There's not much else to say about that. I'm not sure I'm even going to have that question on the exam. We'll probably never use that word again in the semester. So we'll move forward. I won't even ask if there's questions. Some protozoans have a special organelles called contractile vacuoles that continuously eliminate excess cell, excess water from the cell. The presence of these organelles tells you what? So here's what we know. Forget the names, protozoan, organelles, contractile vacuoles, blah, 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 blah. Who even cares? Focus on the important stuff here. What we know is this cell has something that eliminates excess water. So that tells us that this cell has a problem with water coming in. And what makes water come into a cell? It's when the concentration of a solute is higher inside the cell than it is outside the cell. So with that in mind, let's look at the options. Isotonic, that is incorrect because, again, when it's isotonic, water doesn't really move one way or the other. There is no net movement. If the environment is hypotonic to the protozoan, so that means that the environment would have a lower concentration than the protozoan, or another way of saying it, that is that the protozoan has a higher concentration than the environment. So that is the answer. Because if the protozoan, if the cell has a higher concentration, then that means the water is going to keep going in there trying to even things out. And that is why these things need to get rid of extra water because it keeps getting more water in there. That being said, if you were to get this question on the exam, I could change it. So instead of saying that the... Um, the environment is hypotonic to the protozoan. I could change that up and say that the protozoan is hypertonic to the environment. You guys clear with that? Does that make sense? Because it's all relative. Like if I'm describing my brother and I, my younger brother is a lot taller than I am, believe it or not. So if you were saying, if you were describing me, you would say, Vasilios is shorter than Chris. If you were describing Chris, you would say Chris is taller than Vasilios. So, again, just keep that in mind because most likely I'll never give you a question exactly as it's written on the study guide for that reason. I don't want you to memorize these words. I want you to understand the concepts. How tall is your brother? He is six foot nine. Oh, wow. And about half my weight. <laughs> wow. Uh so anyway, number four, the principle that energy cannot be created or destroyed. I'm not, this is such an easy question. I might not have it on the exam, but the answer is simply the conservation of energy. Um, it's weird. It's one of those things. It's such a simple question. And that's why I just don't want to make the exam too easy. And that's why it might not be on there. But on the flip side of that, it's a very important concept. Now that we've been through this whole photosynthesis respiration thing, this idea of conservation of energy, you see how important it is. It's not like respiration creates energy or photosynthesis creates energy we're just converting it from one form to another but anyway the question the answer number that uh, the answer number four is conservation of energy are there any questions about that all right the next one's pretty straightforward too the region of an enzyme where the substrate binds is called what and that's simply the active site it's not much i can say about that <coughs> the active site is where the substrate binds to the enzyme I guess I could change this to say um, the region of an enzyme to which a blank binds is called the active site, in which case, you know, substrate would where I, is where I would have the blank and substrate would be the answer because I would give you active site. It's things to think about when you're studying. Any questions about 21? All right. This one's pretty straightforward as well. Diffusion is an example of what? The answer is simply passive transport. It's when things go from an area of higher concentration to lower concentration. It doesn't require an input of energy. Therefore, it's not active. Um, it's not one cell engulfing another, so it's not phagocytosis. Um, and it's not endocytosis, and there's enough to be said about that. So any questions about number 25? All right, here's one that seems to be tricky based on the answers I've been getting on the study guide. Energy can be defined as what? The capacity to cause change is the answer. And don't let this trick you because 
change can be a lot of things. It could be a change in temperature. It could be a change in position, right? So the capacity to cause movement, that that's not incorrect. It's just not the most correct because the capacity to cause movement is too specific. Um, so it is the capacity to cause change. And maybe if you took the, maybe this question on the exam, this might be a situation where full credit would be that, half credit would be the capacity to cause movement because at least that's on the right track. And these other two nonsense things would be zero credit. So any questions about number two? All right, 37 won't be on the exam. But again, if it's exporting from the cells, it's exocytosis. All right, here's a trickier one. Let's talk about this one. Um, and if you have this question on the exam, the numbers will be different. We have a two, kilo two kilogram bottle of water at zero degrees Celsius. How many calories with a big C are needed to heat up the water to 100 degrees? So first of all, let's make things easier. We know that a calorie with a big C is a kilocalorie, right? So kilo meaning a thousand. So since we're dealing with kilocalories and a kilogram, in a sense, those things just, they just kind of cancel each other off, the kilo parts. So then let's also make things easier for now for this part of the discussion to even get rid of the two. Let's just assume that said one. So then imagine the question said, we have one gram of water. How many calories does it take to heat it up to 100 degrees Celsius? So if that were the question, and I know it might be hard for you to picture that. I wish I could type it for you. But if the question was, you have one gram of water at zero degrees Celsius. How many calories, with a little c, are needed to heat the water up to 100 degrees Celsius? Do either one of you know the answer? <laughs> Do any of you have the answer to that? One gram of water up to 100 degrees Celsius. How many calories? I, I put 2,000, but would it be 10,000? No, no, no. Incorrect. But I'm also, mm -hmm. I'm more interested that you know how to get to the answer than know what the answer is because the uh, on the exam, there won't be these numbers. So if you have one gram of water, well, let me ask you this. If you have one gram of water, how many calories does it take to get it to go up one degree? Uh, I, thought I, I thought it was 100 um or one yeah one right so if you have one gram of water it takes it takes one calorie to get it up by one degree so with that in mind how many calories does it take it to get it up 100 degrees 100 perfect and now let's take back into account the fact that we actually have two not one so that'd be 200 perfect yes yeah that is the answer and that i know that's really convoluted and I do expect a lot of people to miss that one, not because I'm trying to make it hard, but I just understand that is a harder one. And there won't be a lot like that. Actually, there'll only be one like that if there's any at all. So any questions about that? All right. Um, the combination of sucrose, sucrase. Okay. This was the um, follow-up question that we've already talked about because, again, this is on shuffle. So earlier we identified sucrase as the enzyme. Now where it's asking for the substrate, remember the, the glucose. exactly sucrose is the answer because sub, um, enzymes are named after the substrates. And we've already identified the enzyme. Any questions about that? All right. Next one, active transport. Let's just look at all the options. Move solute with their concentration gradient. No, that is incorrect because that's just that's just diffusion. You don't need an input. Active transport is an input of energy, right? You need energy. You don't need energy to go with the concentration gradient or down the concentration gradient would also be um, another word you could use instead of with um, can involve the transport of ions. Yep, that is true. So, yes, um, that is correct. Is a type of facilitated diffusion that is incorrect because, again, it's not diffusion at all because it's active transport. It requires an input of energy. Therefore, it's not any kind of diffusion um, and does not use ATP as an energy source. Again, that is the opposite of true. So for the exam, I would change these options. If this said moves concentration, excuse me, moves solutes against their concentration gradient, then that would be the correct answer. Um, and if this said always involves the transport of ions, then that would be incorrect. Um, if this says is not a type of facilitated diffusion, then it would be the correct answer. If this one said 
does use ATP as an energy source, then that would be the correct answer. So you can see how I could change any of those to be correct or incorrect. So any questions about that one? All right, number 30 or number nine, I just said the answer. This is pretty straightforward. I don't even need to talk about it. Humans convert about how much of the energy stored in food to useful work. The answer is 34. There's nothing much else to say about that. It's just a number you have to memorize if I have it on the exam. Any questions about that one? All right. A balloon permeable to water, not glucose, 10% solution. Beaker has a 5% solution. Which, which statement correctly classifies the solutions? Let's look at the options. The solution in the balloon is hypertonic to the solution in the beaker. Boom, right off the bat, that is the answer, right? Because it's 10% in the balloon. It's only 5% in the beaker. So that is the correct answer. But let's look at the other ones and talk about how I could change the words for the exam. Um, well, no, this one's just straight up wrong. There's nothing we can do about that. The solutions in the balloon and the beaker are isotonic. Obviously not because for them to be isotonic, it would have to be like 10 and 10 or 5 and 5, whatever the case may be. The solutions in the beaker is hypertonic relative to the solutions in the balloon. Nope. We could say that the solution in the beaker is hypotonic to the solution in the balloon because 5 is less than 10, and then that would be the correct answer. But anyway, any questions about number 29? And again, if you see that qu a question like that on the exam, it might not be sucrose. The numbers might not be 10 and 5, or the numbers might be swapped, right? So it could be Again, don't memorize these words. Memorize, understand this concept. In a hypotonic solution, what will a plant do? We've already kind of, a hypotonic, what will a plant do? Um, it'll become flaccid. Because remember, hypotonic, and it might help you to have like a scrap paper when you're taking this part of the exam, to be able to draw it. You draw a little plant cell, and just make up some numbers. So if it's hypotonic solution, the plant maybe you could say is 10% and the outside is 5%. Um, oh, excuse me. I said that wrong. Yeah. Yes. I said that wrong. I love it. I'm catching my, this is the second time I've caught myself on this. So yes, um, because I was picturing drawing it. See, maybe you should have some scrap paper where you draw these things. If you were to draw it, the plant, again, if it's the solution is hypotonic, maybe the plant could say 10%. The, the solution outside is 5%. That means the water would want to come into the plant cell, in which case it would become turgid. Now, for the exam, if you were to guess burst, you would at least get half credit because that's what an animal cell would do. It would burst because water would be coming in. Any of these two things, undergo plasmolysis, I have never even used that word, becomes flaccid. That is the opposite of correct, and it tricked me, so please don't be tricked. Oh, speaking of which, yes, be very careful because I could change this on the exam to say in a hypertonic solution, a plant cell will blank, in which case become flaccid would be the correct answer. Any questions about that? All right. The next one, there's not much to talk about. Anything that prevents ATP formation will kill you. It will result in cell death. There's not much else to say about that. We don't use ADP for energy. Um, <laughs> you can't rely on lipids for energy because the only reason we even use lipids is to break them down to make ATP. Um, and of course, it definitely wouldn't have any effect uh, or would definitely have an effect on the cell. So I couldn't even really reword this much. The answer is it will kill you. It will kill your cells. Um, you're riding your bike down and pedaling, blah, blah, blah. It probably won't be on the exam, but basically it's saying what happens to the energy. What, what You have kinetic energy because you're moving, but then you stopped. So what happened to all that energy? Where did it go? Release one heat. thing you need to know is that when you convert energy from one form to another, some of it is lost as heat. So the answer is released as heat. If you get this question, it most likely won't be about bicycles. But just know that when you convert energy from one form to another, some of it is lost as heat. Any questions about that? All right. This one's pretty straightforward, too. 10 kilocalories are equivalent to what? What you really need to know that a kilocalorie is 1,000 calories, so 10,000 calories. There's your answer. And obviously for the exam, it would be some other number, maybe 5 kilocalories. Or a million kilocalories. I don't know. That's, that's where I got confused with the thousand. Oh, right. Yeah. Between the two calories. That's understandable. Um, any questions about that one? All right. Here we're coming back to this one again. Which environments will be best for the functioning of an animal and a plant cell? Before I even say this, just 
keep in mind, I've already mentioned some version of this question a few times. So most likely, if anything, you're only going to get one, probably just one version of it. Like, I don't need to keep testing you on this one concept in all these different ways. But anyway, let's look at the options. Hypotonic environment for animal cells. If it was hypotonic, that means the water would leave the animal cells. So that's not good. We'll go ahead and skip that one. Hypotonic for plant cells. Again, not good because then the water would be leaving the plants. Oh, excuse me. Nope. Nope. Sorry. Here we go. I'm going too fast. I'm tripping myself up so I can see how you guys might make the same mistakes on the exam. Let me go back up to here. If it's a hypotonic environment for the animal cells, water would be going into the animal cells, which would be bad because it would eventually make them blow up, basically. Now here, a hypotonic environment for plant cells is good because plant cells have that cell wall. So as the water's coming in, that's good for the plant cells. Let's look at the, uh, the other one. Isotonic for animal cells. Perfect. Yes, animal cells like isotonic. They don't need water coming in. They don't need water going out. They like it to be right there in the middle. So that would be the correct answer. Um, any questions about that? All right. Substances that plug up an enzyme's active site are what? This is pretty straightforward. There's not much else to say about it. They are simply inhibitors. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I might give you partial credit for saying substrate or products because, I mean, technically a substrate does plug up an enzyme's active site, except the, the verbiage is off because, I don't know, if it's a substrate, it's not necessarily plugging up the active site. It's just in its own it's, it's where it's supposed to be um products that's sort of true because if you remember back to the lecture i said that sometimes the products of a chemical reaction are um, very often the the inhibitor themselves because once you have enough of whatever it is you're trying to produce then you want to you know somehow stop that enzyme from producing more of it so again inhibitors is the correct answer i might get partial credit for those and catalyst no definitely not does not fit into that conversation. So any questions about number 24? Um, eight, we're just going to skip because I told you at the beginning of that chapter that we wouldn't have that conversation or, they, or they wouldn't have those questions on the exam. Um, which process could result in the net movement of substance into a cell if the substance is more concentrated in the cell? So this is saying, this is basically saying what process can make something go against its concentration gradient? not with its concentration gradient, right? Because if it's going with its concentration gradient, that's just simply diffusion. So what process can do the opposite of diffusion? Active transport. Again, think of the analogy of the one, excuse me, 500 people in the classroom. If you were to open the door, they would naturally want to diffuse out. That wouldn't require energy. However, if you wanted to push, if you wanted to get more people into that tight classroom, then you'd have to push them in. That would require energy for them to go against their concentration gradient. So the answer is A. Um, not much else I can say about that. Any questions? All right. Which statement about enzymes is true? Let's look at all the options, and I'll also tell you how I could reword them. Enzymes are the products in a chemical reaction. That is incorrect, but I could make it correct by saying enzymes are not the products of in a chemical reaction. Enzymes catalyze specific reaction. That is the correct answer. I could make it incorrect by saying enzymes catalyze a wide range of reactions or something to that effect, something opposite of specific. Enzymes are the reactants in a chemical reaction. That is incorrect. I could make that a correct statement by saying enzymes are not the reactants in a chemical reaction. And then finally, enzymes functions require inhibitors. I could make that is incorrect. I could make that correct by saying let's see enzymes functions or enzymes sometimes use inhibitors right they don't require them but they do sometimes use them so any questions about number 18 <coughs> like how many questions are on the exam should be i'm shooting for about 50 you yeah, don't try to trick us up too bad because remember we only got a minute per question yep well i do that on purpose um it's because since it's online i don't really have a way to make sure you're taking a closed book exam. So I'm just trying to make sure no one has time to look up every single question, which is why and this is a good time because I didn't say this earlier. So it's a good time for me to remind anybody watching this. If you want longer than 50 minutes, I don't care if it takes you all day. That's fine with me. As long as you and I are face to face and I can see that you're not taking an open book exam and you're not 
on the internet and you don't have earbuds in and you're listening to something. So, you know, that option is always there. Just make sure you let me know before, before Monday, you can't send me an email at eight o'clock AM and say, Hey, uh, I decided <coughs> I want to take the exam in, in person. It's too late at that point. Well, you can still take it in person, but at that point, technically you have missed the exam, which means it'll be a harder version when you do take it. So great question. I'm glad you asked that. Any other questions? All right. Oh, another thing I could add to this multiple choice on the exam, um, I could say something like enzymes um, are used up in a chemical reaction, right? And that would be incorrect. And that would basically be saying, That'd be another way of saying that enzymes are the reactants. That's another thing, way of saying enzymes are used up. Then that would also be an incorrect statement. Anyway, diffusion, man, we're beating this dead horse. Um, occurs when particles spread from areas where they're less concentrated and more. Nope, that's the opposite of true. That's uh, that's um, active transport. But I could change that to make it correct by saying more concentrated to less concentrated. Um, is the result of energy transformation? No, that's just some some garbage that they threw in there to trick you. So you would lose more points for guessing that. Um, requires an input of cellular energy? No, that is the opposite of true, again, because that would be like active transport. And here's the correct answer. Proceeds until dynamic equilibrium is reached. So any questions about that? All right, this next one is also pretty straightforward. The definition of osmosis. Uh, diffusion of a solute. Nope, right off the bat. We know that's not it because it's the diffusion of water. So not solute. Active transport. Nope, because we're talking about diffusion, not um, active transport. Diffusion of water. So far, so good. Across the selectively permeable membrane. Yes, there's the answer. The diffusion of water across the selectively permeable membrane. It's not active transport. It's diffusion. It's not diffusion of a solute. It's a diffusion of water. Um, yeah. So any questions about 28? Seven will definitely not be on this exam because I told you specifically when I gave you this concept that it is not important for the rest of the semester. You could not, you could completely brain dump the word entropy and um, understand every single concept in this in this course. So the answer to seven is entropy, and it won't be on the exam. Facilitated diffusion across a biological membrane requires blank and moves the substance blank. So here we go. Another question about facilitated diffusion. Facilitated means. Well, let's focus on this word diffusion. First of all, we know it's diffusion. It's not active transport. Therefore, we know it doesn't require energy. And therefore, we know it's going down the concentration gradient, right? Because that's what diffusion does. That being said, let's look at the option. Requires energy? No, because like we just said, it's diffusion. No energy required. No input of energy. Requires transport proteins? Yes, because it's facilitated, not just regular diffusion. It's facilitated diffusion. And down its concentration gradient. Boom. There's the correct answer. Um, and, of course, this one's incorrect because it's not the transport proteins part is correct, but the against part is incorrect. But, again, for the exam, you know, B, you would get full credit. D, you know, you'd probably get partial credit. And then uh, these other two, you would just get no credit at all. Number one, I told you we'd skip that, and we are skipping that. Here's a tougher one. I wish I could just draw this. It would be so much. Oh, I can draw this. I'm going to stop presenting for a second. Nah, I don't have time. I don't want to waste your time. I'm just going to go through this. And um, if later, if when we're done having this whole conversation, if you want me to come back to this, I will. Um, where are we at? Chapter 5 study guide. Okay. Until then, just try to picture what we're looking at here. We have... Four beakers with some liquid in them and some solute. Each one of them has a balloon in it. And the difference is the balloon, right? The, one of the balloons has, or one of the balloons in beaker has 0% solute. I don't know who cares. It's even salt. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the solute is. 0% for one, 5% for the other, 10% for the other, and 15% for the other. All right. Each of the beakers has a 10% salt solution. So what we're looking at here, or let's look at the end here. At equilibrium, what is the correct order of balloon volumes from largest to the smallest? So really what we're asking is, 
which of these balloons is going to get the most water coming into it. So let's just look at this. This one has zero and it's in a beaker that has 10. Therefore, Balloon A is going to get even smaller, right? Because all that water is going to leave Balloon A because it's going to want to try to um, make this number larger, smaller. So Balloon A is going to be the smallest, right? Because it's going to just keep putting out water until this hits zero and it never will. Then the next smallest is going to be the 5% one because, again, it's putting out water because it wants to get – it wants this – that's 5% and this 10% to equal. So if this number will keep going down, excuse me, up. This number will keep going down. Basically, yeah, and I can keep going, but you get the picture, right? We have water leaving balloon A. We have even, excuse me, we have a lot of water leaving balloon A. We have a little bit of less water leaving balloon B. Balloon C is completely the same because it's 10% and 10%. So there's no water leaving or coming in. And then finally, balloon D water is actually going to go into that balloon. So from largest to smallest, the answer is D, C, B, A. That is the answer. And of course, for the exam, I might, if I were to give you this, I might give you different numbers. I might use, say, something other than salt. It might be sucrose. Um, and then the most important part is the question might say, which is the correct order of balloons from smallest to largest? So pay attention. Any questions about that one? Well, I take that back. I'm not going to take questions on that one. But after this whole conversation's over, if you want to, I can come back to that. Uh, number 13, ATP energizes other molecules. How? That's a simple, nothing much to say. It transfers a phosphate group. Any questions about that? All right. I need to take a two-minute break before we start Chapter 6 and 7. Literally two minutes at the most. So I'll be back if that's okay with you. Well, I'm sorry, it has to be, but I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. Sorry, is everybody else still here? Or did I come back too early? I'm here. Okay. I'm here. Perfect. Okay, I apologize for that. So here we go. Let's jump into number six and seven. This one will be a lot quicker. The reason that the chapter six and seven study guide is unlike the other ones is because I just wanted to trim the fat. Like every single question on the six and seven study guide will be on the exam. There is no question about like, will that one be on the exam or not? So here we go. <clears throat> yeah, let's see. Chapters. Actually, let me do my entire screen for this one. All right. Chapter six. All right. So the first one is pretty straightforward. And this is one of those is really, really easy. And it's one of those I get really sad when someone misses it. Which we're talking, this is like big picture. So we're not like dissecting the differences, you know, the, all the different stages of photosynthesis or all the different stages of respiration. This is like big one, the difference between the two. Um, respiration uses glucose and oxygen to make carbon dioxide and water. Um, obviously, the opposite of that is photosynthesis uses carbon dioxide and water to make glucose and oxygen. Make sense? All right. Here's a tougher one. Well, no, it's not necessarily tougher, but it's tougher in the study guide than it is on the exam. In respiration, which stage, parenthesis S, like hint, well, that's not really hint because they all say that, but 
It could be one stage. It could be multiple stages. So in respiration, which stages produce ATP? And the answer is all of them. They all produce ATP. Um, let me look at something really quick. Yeah. So this is actually, and you guys get a little glance. This is what your exam actually looks like. This is a question from your exam. This is exam two. So which produces ATP? Look at the choices. Here's the correct answer right here, because like I said, it's all three. Wait. Yeah. Glycolysis, citric acid cycle, electron transport chain, all three. So if you guess that, you get full credit. If you guess glycolysis and electron transport chain, no, no, I don't want to say that for this one. This, this is one of those all or nothing. So the answer is all three produce ATP. So, But this is what your choices are going to look like. So any questions about that? Whoop. Get rid of that now. Okay. So which stage produces the most ATP? And the answer there is simply the electron transport chain. Not much else to say about this. Most of this is pretty straightforward. Any questions about two or three? All right. Um, in respiration, which, well, which, which one happens outside of the mitochondria? In other words, inside the cell, inside the cytoplasm. And simply the answer is, yes, exactly, glycolysis. Of course, I could reword this to say in respiration, which stages or stage occur inside the mitochondria? In which case the answer would be, um, uh, Here, it would be this one, citric acid cycle and electron transport chain. So you can see that one question could be worded two different ways. What happens inside the mitochondria? What happens outside the mitochondria? In respiration, which stages or stage, let's say I might even change this to make sure it's clear on the exam, directly uses oxygen. Obviously, they're all indirectly use oxygen. But which one is the one stage where the oxygen is actually used? And the answer is the electron transport chain. And the way you could remember that, and this is what I'm about to tell you is an important concept for other questions too, the oxygen is the final electron acceptor. In the big picture, the electrons came from glucose. That's where they ultimately came from. And they ultimately ended up at the oxygen. So obviously, if that is the ultimate, the end electron acceptor, you would expect that to be in the last stage. So hopefully that helps you remember that the answer number five is um, the electron transport chain. So any questions about that one? All right, number six is pretty straightforward. Which stage produces carbon dioxide? Like I keep saying over and over and over and over and over and over again in this question, in this exam, anything that has to do with carbon dioxide, the answer is gonna be some sort of cycle. So if it's respiration, it's the citric acid cycle with all those Cs. And if it's, um, well, we'll come back to the other one. So yeah, the answer is citric acid cycle. Any questions about that? All right, this one's pretty straightforward too. Which one uses glucose? Uh, which of the three stages? The answer is simply glycolysis. Um, and the two easy ways to remember that is glycolysis sounds a little bit like glucose. Um, and also, if you can remember that glycolysis is the first of the stage, and obviously glucose is a it's where those electrons originally came from. So again, first step, right? So any questions about that? All right, pretty straightforward. In respiration, which, uh, in respiration, which stage produces water? And the answer is the electron transport chain. And the way you could remember that, I hope you can remember it. Just remember, water and oxygen, in this exam, they go together. Because in respiration, Oxygen gets those electrons, which produces water. And then skip ahead to what we're going to talk about later. In photosynthesis, water gives up the electrons to become oxygen, right? So oxygen and water are always going to be in the same stage, whether we're talking about photosynthesis or respiration. So any questions about that? Okay. In respiration, which stage or stages uses hydrogen ions going down the concentration gradient to produce ATP? The answer is electron transport chain. And really, a little hint here, the one thing that could help you is uses hydrogen ions. That's enough, right? There's only one stage that uses hydrogen ions, whether we're talking about pumping them against their concentration gradient or letting them come back down. 
either way, it's only the electron transport chain that does anything with hydrogen ions. So any questions about that? Tin's pretty straightforward. Which one produces pyruvate? It's simply glycolysis, and there's nothing much else I can say about that. Glycolysis starts with glucose, and it breaks it down, breaks it in half, and then and you get up two molecules of pyruvate. Oh, speaking of which, I told you many times that you don't need to know the numbers, and that's still true. You don't need to know that you started with one molecule of glucose and ended up with two molecules of pyruvate. That I'm thinking about possibly adding some extra credit questions um, that include information that I specifically told you you didn't need to know. Just to see, like, if, if you happen to be a good studier and remember some of these things, then you should be uh, rewarded. But, again, it would be extra credit. It wouldn't hurt you. Um, in respiration, which stages are associated with acetic acid and acetyl-CoA? Simply, the answer is the citric acid cycle. And the hint there is the acid. Um, and, again, that's why I call the citric acid cycle the citric acid cycle and not the Krebs cycle. Because any questions you get that have anything to do with acid, you should think of citric acid cycle. So any questions about that? All right. Um, which stage uses ATP? It's synthase. There was only one stage where we actually named the enzyme that makes the, the, the ATP, and that was the electron transport chain. And hopefully the way you can remember that is if you remember that the electron transport chain is the one that makes the most ATP and that the other two stages are basically there to support the electron transport chain, then hopefully in your mind you can think, okay, that's obviously the most important one. Therefore, it would make sense that if we're going to name an enzyme, it would be in that one and not the other ones. Because remember, even in the first one, glycolysis, I showed you a picture of an enzyme and we talked about it, but I never gave it a name because in the grand scheme of things, it's not that important for us. Anyway, any questions about that? All right, in respirations, which stages uses NADH carrying high energy electrons to pump hydrogen ions against a concentration gradient? This one gives you, there's two ways you can get the correct answer in this. The answer is electron transport chain. But here we have uses NADH, right, carrying high energy electrons. So if it's using high energy electrons as opposed to stripping them away, then the answer is electron transport chain. And again, like I said earlier, if it has anything to do with hydrogen ions, whether it's going up or down the concentration gradient, then we are talking about the electron transport chain. So two ways for you to, you know, get the correct answer on that one. Any questions about that? No. Likewise, on this next one, which uses NAD plus to strip away high energy electrons? So the answer there is glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. Now, I know this could be a little bit tricky because I did say in many times in the um, in the lecture, I said you don't need to necessarily differentiate between NAD plus and NADH. But the way you can get around that is this word here, uh, this part here, strip away. If you're stripping away the high energy electrons, that's the first two stages. If you're using the high energy electrons, that is the electron transport chain. And that should make sense. It's in the name. The electron transport chain, it's all about using electrons. Therefore, the other two must be collecting those enzyme, or those electrons for the electron transport chain. Any questions about that? No. All right. Before I move on to the next one, because this one gets a little bit trickier, let me pull something up on the exam. But I have to stop sharing because I don't want you to see the whole entire exam. Uh, let's see. Which, um, let me look at this. Sorry for the wait, guys. Provides, provides, uh, yeah, it provides. Oh, high energy. Oh, this is not giving me what I'm looking for here. High energy strips away high energy electrons. Oh, right, here we go. So this, what we're looking at here, oh, I'm sorry, let me pull it back up for you. This one, which seems tricky, hopefully it'll be a little bit less tricky for the exam, especially now that I'm basically about to give you the, the, the dang answer here. But actually, no, I can't do that. So let me just do it this way. Which molecule provides high energy electrons? Or the, yes, provides high energy electrons for the above process. Another way you could say this is 
in respiration, high energy electrons come from what? And are ultimately accepted by what? Which then forms a molecule of what? And your choices are ATP, carbon dioxide, glucose, oxygen, and water, right? And in this case, it, it's still, you still have, you have to type it in. So I guess you might say it's not multiple choice because of that, but it is. You have choices. Whoops. Anyway, yeah, you have choices. It's just not one of those where you click it. So you have to write the answers down. But again, let's look at it. Again, remember, ultimately, the high energy electrons from respiration, they came from glucose. So the answer is glucose. Now, and I don't remember, Vance, were you one of those that got that one wrong? But technically it was, no, I think you got that one correct, didn't you? I think I got it correct. Okay. I think I missed most of them, like toward the end here. Okay. So, yes, it is the um, the glucose that provides those high energy electrons. Um, yeah, I think somebody I was looking at, I'm trying to remember all the study guides, I think I've read. And I think somebody here put NADH as the answer. Uh, no, it was me. Okay. Put NADH. Well, the way this question is written, that's not an incorrect statement because NADH, well, not necessarily. I guess that is kind of incorrect because NADH is not giving up electrons to NAD+, right? NAD+, is getting those electrons somewhere else to become NADH. So let's just not make it more complicated than it needs to be. Um, glucose is the molecule that provides the electrons. And then the opposite part of that is, all right, if that's where they come from, where do they go? Which molecule accepts those high energy electrons? And again, this is harder without the choices. That's a citric acid cycle. Ah, see, that's where it gets tricky for you, but you won't make that mistake on the exam because citric acid cycle won't even be an option. Uh, the key, the key word here is molecule, right? You uh, just you listed, uh, you named a um, a stage, but we're talking about the molecule. And the molecule, remember, the final electron acceptor is oxygen. So the uh, the electrons come from glucose, and it is oxygen that ultimately accepts them and what happens when the oxygen ultimately accepts the electrons that's this next question then it becomes then we get a molecule of water so this goes back to the same question i was talking about earlier like which stage uses oxygen what stage produces water so just remember those electrons have to come from somewhere they have to go somewhere they come from the glucose electron is the final excuse me, oxygen is the final electron acceptor. And when it gets those electrons, it becomes water. So that's, but again, most of the mistakes I saw, people were making, I won't even call them mistakes. People were making the correct, making correct statements. It just wouldn't be correct on the exam, but it doesn't matter because on the exam, those incorrect things, those things that other people were writing um, won't even be an option. So remember, electrons come from glucose, go to oxygen, and that becomes water. Any questions about those three? No. Okay. Um, this was pretty straightforward. Sometimes cell undergo anaerobic respiration. I do remember your answer to this one, Vance. That was you were correct um, in a sense. The best answer for this is fermentation. Cells when it's anaerobic respiration, it's fermentation. Now, granted, fermentation only utilizes glycolysis, and that was your answer, Vance, which was good. You were on the right track. You knew what you were talking about. Um, but glycolysis itself is not anaerobic respiration, right? Glycolysis is just so happens. That's the one of this, that's this, the only stage being used in anaerobic respiration. So again, anaerobic, <coughs> excuse me, anaerobic respiration is called fermentation. And of course on the exam, it'll be multiple choice. So glycolysis probably won't even be an option. So any questions about that? All right. Actually, let me, before I move forward, who knows? It might be an option. I don't even want to say it probably won't be an option. It might be an option. So just know that fermentation is the correct answer because that is the most correct answer. No matter what I put on there for the options, fermentation will be the most correct option. All right. The next one. In anaerobic respiration, muscle cells produce, and the answer is lactic acid. Muscle cells produce lactic acid. Now, Technically, yeast cells produce both, 
but we're just going to focus on the fact that yeast cells produce ethanol. So muscle cells, lactic acid, yeast cells, ethanol, or alcohol, or ethyl alcohol, any any version, all of those three things, as far as this question is concerned, those are the same words. So any questions about that? All right, this one's pretty straightforward too. How many ATP molecules are produced inside the respiration? The answer is, according to your textbook, 32. About 32, yep. Um, yeah, yeah. So for extra credit, I might ask you on a different question, how many are produced in glycolysis? How many are produced in, in um, citric acid cycle? Because like I said in the um, in the lecture, I said you don't have to know that, and you don't. But if you just so happen to, if you happen to memorize it, might as well get rewarded for it. So that might be an extra credit question. We'll see. <coughs> in photosynthesis, which stages? All right, let's clear our mind here. Make sure we know what we're doing. We are now done talking about respiration. We are now moving into photosynthesis. Which uses ATP? And the answer is the Calvin cycle. Remember, it is the Calvin cycle that it's the that's the sugar factory. That's the thing that's actually building the molecules of glucose. And remember, it takes energy to build molecules. So obviously, that's going to be the cycle that's using energy, aka ATP, right? So hopefully that makes sense to you and you can remember it that way. If you're using energy, that's got to be the thing that's building something, which is the Calvin cycle. So any questions about that? All right. Which uses photons to excite or energize electrons? The answer is simply the light reactions. And the best way to remember that is obviously, you know, photons come from light. So, of course, it's going to be the light reactions and not the Calvin cycle. Um, and also, here we're talking about exciting or energizing electrons, right? The Calvin cycle uses excited electrons, Um so if we're talking about exciting them, then obviously it must be the other option, which is light reactions. So there's two different ways you can get to the answer for that one. Any questions about that? All right, now we get into the trickier stuff, just like we did with respiration. It got tricky. But here we go. We're saying that in photosynthesis, photons get excited, right? Photons excite electrons, excuse me. So then the question is, all right, if we're exciting electrons, where do those electrons ultimately come from? Like, where did they come from? Just like the same thing we're asking about in respiration. But in this case, remember, it's the opposite of respiration. The water is the thing that gives up the electrons. Water's like, hey, here's some regular old electrons, and then the photons excite them. So in photosynthesis, which molecules provide electrons for the above process? And the molecule is water. And Vance, if I remember correctly, I think you may have said something that was sort of correct, but the key word here for you would be molecule because I think you mentioned a stage instead of a molecule. So the answer is water. Water is the molecule that's giving up electrons. And of course, like we've already said up here, this is all happening in the light reactions. So anyway, what happens when that water gives up the electrons? It then becomes oxygen, <coughs> right? Because it's the opposite of respiration. And like I said earlier in this discussion, in this exam, Water, oxygen, and electrons, those should all go together in this in, in this exam, right? When we're talking about photosynthesis or respiration, whatever stage we're talking about, water, oxygen, and resp and um, water, oxygen, and good grief. What am I thinking? Water, oxygen, take it. Man, I've lost my mind. Anyway, yes. So it is um, the oxygen that accepts, excuse me. Water gives up the electrons, and that produces oxygen. So any questions about those two? All right. So, again, water has given up these electrons, um, which, which has given us water. I mean, excuse me, oxygen. And these electrons that water has given up have been excited by the photons. So, in what stage of photosynthesis are we using those high energy electrons right we've we've the water's donated them then we've excited them so which one is using those electrons here's the key here to produce atp it's an electron transport chain you're right and you're wrong you are correct in that's so good because it is the electron transport chain that is producing the atp so what you'll need to remember actually no because it'll be multiple choice so you won't have that option 
electron transport chain will not be an option? The answer is the light reactions. But again, you are correct because the light reactions utilize an electron transport chain. That's that's what that's how it produces ATP. Um, so for you, you'll be OK, because, again, um, electron transport chain will not be an option on the multiple choice. And the answer is the light reactions. Because, again, and here's the here's the key. Produce ATP. Remember, glycolysis needs the ATP. She's a good grief. Um, the Calvin cycle needs the ATP to make that sugar, right? So the opposite of that is the light reaction produces the ATP. So hopefully, hopefully that'll help you remember that one. Um, and photosynthesis, which stages uses high energy electrons? So, so far, these two questions are the same, but here's where it gets different to produce glucose. And basically, you could just get rid of all that other crap and just say, which stage produces glucose? So the answer is simply the Calvin cycle. That's the thing squishing a, squishing a bunch of carbons together to make glucose. So any questions about that? Likewise, I just gave the answer away to this next question. Which stages uses carbon dioxide? Like I said earlier, it's the Calvin cycle that's squishing a bunch of carbons together to make glucose. So the answer is Calvin cycle. And again, like I keep saying for this exam, when you, any questions about carbon dioxide or CO2 or however you want to say it, the answer is always going to be cycle because of all the C's. Um, citric acid cycle produces carbon dioxide. Calvin cycle uses carbon dioxide. Any questions about that? All right. Here's another tearjerker question. I say tearjerker because somebody's going to miss it and it's I put it on here to be easy. If we're talking about photosynthesis and respiration, which one happens in the mitochondria? Which one happens in the Photo, uh, the chloroplast um, respiration happens in the mitochondria. Uh, photosynthesis happens in the chloroplast. That's one of the easiest questions. Someone will miss it. I will shed a tear. I will know my some. I have failed my job. Um, anyway, in photosynthesis, which stages uses chlorophyll? I'm hoping this one's a kind of easy one too. Remember, chlorophyll is a pigment. A pigment is something that basically it's um, interacting with light, right? So therefore, it would be a, the light reaction. And that's it. What was number 28 again? Respiration takes place in the mitochondria. Oh, yeah. And photosynthesis takes place in the chloroplast. Okay. So about the extra credit. Did any of you get the extra credit on the first exam from the study, from this study session? No, I mean, I missed the study guide okay. review. All right, so it's going to work the same way it did last time. There's going to be an extra credit question, and the answers are going to make, like the choices will make absolutely no sense. Actually, the question itself will make no sense. And the answer to that question is going to be speaker. I'll even okay. type it. I'm going to type it right here. Whoops. Control Z. Yeah, speaker, like, you know, something that plays music. Speaker. So no matter what, when you get a question that makes absolutely no sense, like that last one did, and you get all these long choices that make no sense as well, the answer is speaker. Now here's yeah, I, the, did, I didn't know, so I picked the craziest answer on the thing. That's good. At least you tried. You had a one in 20-something chance of getting the right one. Um, so last time it was a 10% boost to your grade, whatever it was. So if you had an 80, then you would end up with an 88. If you had a 90, you would end up with a 99, so on and so forth. This time, I'm not sure what it's going to be. It'll probably be a 10%, but here's the thing. The only way it's different this time is the more people get, who get it correct, the less it's worth. What I'm trying to prevent here is you guys being great classmates and you know, emailing your, uh, your, your fellow classmates and saying, look, the key word here is speaker. So if you get that right, then uh, you'll get a lot of extra credit. So I don't know how much it's going to be worth yet. I'll just tell you that the more people who get it correct, the less it's worth. So it's in your best interest to not give somebody the keyword. They need to study. They need to watch this video, in which case they will get this this keyword. So, yeah, that's it. Right. Does anybody else have questions about anything? Um, could you go over the last question again? This one? Yes, please. Yeah, it just says, uh, okay, in photosynthesis, which stage uses chlorophyll? 
And the answer is simply the light reactions. And I was saying the way you can remember that is um, uh, chlorophyll is that green pigment, right? And pigments are things that interact with light. So if you think of something that interacts with light, obviously it would be the light reaction that it's being used. Which, oh, that brings me to, I'm trying to think of it. Some, I got a great wrong answer. Uh, in photosynthesis, which molecule provides the electrons? I like this. Somebody wrote chlorophyll, and they were technically correct. Because technically, like I said, water, they ultimately come from water. But water gives up those molecules to the chlorophyll, and that's technically where they get excited. So, but so for the person, if that person is watching this video, then that's why your answer, well, you got the points for it, but <clears throat> on the exam, it will not be chlorophyll because technically the water ultimately, the electrons ultimately came from water. And, um, but anyway, uh, chlorophyll will not be one of the options on that multiple choice question. So, shouldn't be, shouldn't be an issue, should be easy. So, any other questions about? the concepts or the administration of the exam at all, or anything for that matter, while I have you on here and it's getting recorded. No, thank you for taking your time on a Saturday to do this for us. My pleasure. I'm just here to, here to teach. And I love it when people are here to learn. So uh, I guess if you do think of something, either you two or anybody who's watching this video, just get in touch with me and I'll try to answer any questions you have between now and then. Ho hopefully I'll be able to. That's it. Then if you guys don't have anything, I will stop recording and hang up. Okay. Thank you. You're up.